All right, good morning. Good morning. Um, Jesus often teaches with parables, and the disciples ask him why he teaches with parables. And he says, because it's given you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. And so he goes on and he says, for whoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. Wow. But whoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that that he hath. So people, uh, parables, it seems to me, were really an, an oriental practice. When people were illiterate, um, and of course there was nothing to read, even if people could read, there, it's not like there were books, <laughs> um, that where people were illiterate, parables illustrated truth or teaching or some principle, and so the story was easier for people to remember. So that makes sense to us all, right? Um, in Science of Mind, we teach that heaven is a state of consciousness, an awareness of our oneness with God, of our connection with other people, that it's not a location. Ernest says that it's a state of happiness. I think that's great, that heaven is actually a state of happiness. He says, it is the real state of being. We don't make it real, for it is an eternal reality. So heaven always exists. That place of knowing our connection with God, our connection with other people, that always, always exists. He says, if we abide in the Father and he in us in harmony and power and peace and wisdom, and our thought is friendly, happy, confident, and open, our kingdom of heaven is a good place to live. So what Ernest is saying to us is that, you know what, if your mind is in the right place, it's good to be you. It's good to be in your body, in your life, in your affairs, if things are going well in here, right? But let's be really clear. If things are not going well in here, you ain't going to find any heaven out here. It just isn't going to happen. That's not the way it works. Remember, he says, it's a state of happiness. Now, Ernest, um, he goes on, and he says uh, that the kingdom of God is the consciousness of God. If we think of the thoughts of God, if we think the thoughts of God, we shall have a, never, a, a newer, diviner life in our body and in our affairs. We shall have entered the kingdom. So the thing is, there is a distinction that I'm seeing now between what was referred to as the kingdom of heaven and what's referred to as the kingdom of God. And Jesus refers to both, but he doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. And I think we have thought they were just the same. We just sort of grouped them together. Right, so, where, so what I get to ask myself is, where am I thinking something that God is not thinking? Because that will surely keep me out of a kingdom kind of consciousness. When I entertain thoughts, so, you know, if I think thoughts about other people or situations in the world or my neighbor or coworker or whatever, that are not what God's thinking. What's God thinking? God looks at all of us, and God loves each and every one of us because we are all emanations of the Most High God. And we say, God doesn't make any junk. Right? So it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It, now, that sounds great, but you know what? It is also our privilege to be able to accept it. And I find that people have a hard time with the accepting part, that we all like to be the giver. We all like to be on that end of the stick, but to be the accepting, wow, that's a lot harder for people. But before we can even do that, first we have to seek the kingdom. And what I think this means right now today, if you ask me next week, I'll probably have something else. But where I, where I sit with this today, how I interpret this today is, all right, to seek first the kingdom means I'm not going to rely on externals. I'm not going to rely on um, people outside of me. I'm not going to rely on things like a job. This, you know, um, if I say, well, this doesn't fit my picture, um, Am I seeking the kingdom first? And what that kingdom is, is always a connection with the something greater. So it's um, not, an, uh, not an experience you can have in life. Uh, I think there's not an experience that we can have in life. There's nothing that we can go through that there isn't something in the great uh, tomb of spiritual literature, you know, the Bible and other things that addresses that. You know, if you... Um, uh, and I believe that how this works is that if you love something, um, it will eventually reveal its secrets to you. So I've had, um, in the past, a kind of dicey relationship with the Bible. 
uh, because I didn't uh, understand. I didn't, uh, and because I didn't understand, I didn't go into it, and so because I didn't go into it, I didn't understand anymore. It was just a vicious cycle of my own ignorance. You know, and then I decided at some point that other people I had heard talk about the Bible, they were telling me what they thought, what they believed, and that might actually be their truth, but it wasn't necessarily my truth. You know, because I think the Bible is one of those things that it's really up for interpretation. You know, and so people bring something of their own consciousness to the interpretation. In Ernest Holmes' statement, What I Believe, he writes that the kingdom of heaven is within humankind. You know, but it has to be recognized. And he says this recognition of the kingdom of heaven within us is actually a mental act. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within you. So we've also heard that the kingdom of God is within you. Now, they're different. I think today they're different. So when he talks about the kingdom of heaven, he usually talks about good mixed with evil in some form or another. And he says things uh, within the parables that indicate that the kingdom of heaven is not the ultimate state of perfection. Yeah. And at one point in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven shall pass away. Now, I have probably read that, I couldn't tell you how many times, and when I read it this time, that like jumped out and hit me in the face. It's like, oh my God, the kingdom of heaven is going to pass away. What does that mean? If this is the kingdom of God, how can it pass away, right? So he's not talking about the same thing at all. I think in terms of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, I think there are two different entities. There are two different experiences of consciousness for us. So the kingdom of God, let will talk about that for a second, is the fullness of God's mind that indwells us. We say in the science of mind, the fullness, the allness of God exists within each and every one of us right now. That is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is the state of consciousness that we go through to get to the kingdom of God. Right? The kingdom of heaven is not that perfect state, but it's that state that is leading us to greater, a greater experience of perfection. So there is a parable um, about the tares and the wheat in, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. And it says that a man sowed good seeds, uh, uh, wheat seeds, in his field. And, uh, but while he slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. Right? So the wheat represents the good, obviously, and the tares represent evil or error. Uh, and so there was error among the truth. Okay? So tares among the wheat mean that there's error among the truth. There's evil among the good. What does this mean? That consciousness that we dwell in at this stage of our lives is mixed with both truth and error. I mean, we know that because we, we live in the world. And if you look at the newspaper or watch the news or listen to the radio, there's lots of error mixed in, right? Lots of things that are somewhat less than the spiritual truth. You know, has anybody said, oh my gosh, I feel terrible, or oh, I feel sick today, or I don't have enough, I'm afraid, nobody likes me, anything like that in the last month. If you've ever said anything like that, what I would say is you have tares mixed in with your wheat, that there's a little bit of error that you're still allowing to exist with what's good. And yet deep down, I think I know for all of us that who we are is that we are children of God. We are filled with light. We are filled with the light of God. We are filled with the love of God. And all of us, to some extent, probably have a few tares, maybe more than a few. It depends on the day. Uh, mixed in with our wheat. You know, when consciousness goes to sleep, as it does, right? and it always has, it always has. People will say to me, oh, when, I got, when you say I have to meditate, you know, I fall asleep all the time I meditate. Every time I sit to meditate, I fall asleep. I say, I know, I understand. It's like, really? I'm, I'm not unique? I'm not special with that? It's like, no, nope, no, nope, that problem has been around for 2,500 years. Buddha identified it 2,500 years ago that one of the enemies of meditating is the sinking mind. That's the tendency to fall asleep. Now, you know, other people say, oh, well, I can't meditate because, you know, my mind is just so jumpy. I just go ping pong all over the place. And yeah, yeah, Buddha got that one too. He really did. 2,500 years ago, Buddha said the other enemy of meditation is the monkey mind, where your mind jumps all over the place. So if you have a tendency to jump around in your thinking when it's time to meditate, you're right on track. And if you have a tendency to go to sleep when you meditate, you're right on track. 
Yeah, isn't that good news? And you thought you were so special. I thought I was so special. And then I realized, oh, this has been happening for thousands of years. Where was I? What was I talking about? Um, oh, I know. So when consciousness goes to sleep, you know, um, the, the difficulty, the error, the enemy, you know, uh, can start to take over more real estate in our consciousness, you know? That, that would be our consciousness of error, you know? And, and what, that, what happens then when our consciousness is not awake, when we're not present, when we're not alert, when we're not being mindful about how we're thinking and how we're living, errors get sown in with the truth. Tears get sown in with the wheat, you know? And so doubt gets planted. The, you know, this is the thing that I come to realize in Science of Mind, is that the enemy is not out there. And, and I know, I grew up always thinking that there was an enemy out there, you know, that we were at war with somebody out there, that there was somebody out there who might be trying to hurt us in some way. Science of Mind says the enemy is not out there, it's in here, which is actually the worst place it could be, right? It's your mind used against you. You know, we all know, there's not a person in this room who doesn't know that your thought is powerful. Because, why is your thought powerful? Because your thought is a creative activity, right? Now, turning that creative activity against yourself is the worst thing we can do, and yet there's not a person who hasn't done that at some time. Some of us still do it again and again and again. So Jesus then shows us how to separate the tares from the wheat. He says, you put the tares on the fire. From, right? You separate them from the wheat, and you burn the tares. So you put the tares on the fire, and you burn them up, and the wheat, well, the good, that's what you want to store up. You want to build a mental household, you know, a body of consciousness that's on the affirmative side of life. Now, fire is a symbol of purification. We all understand that. So we have to purify, <clears throat> excuse me, we have to purify whatever the error is in our consciousness. You know, it's not about fighting it, you know, that, that, that if we fight it, then, well, that's probably the best we know at the time. But I have both uh, the misunderstanding and the understanding of the things of God. We all do. There is a part of us that understands and a part of us that doesn't maybe want to make the effort on any given day to understand something deeper. But I believe we have both. We have both of those, the misunderstanding and the understanding. So I get rid of the misunderstandings, right? I get rid of the tears. I get rid of the errors. I get rid of the false beliefs. I get rid of that, that very personal thinking that I have that does not support me in being more of my best self. You know, that thinking where I'm talking myself down, that thinking where I don't believe in myself, right? That's got to go. That's what has to be purified from all of us, you know, because, that, because what that does is that puts us in a state of movement upward, you know, where we're actually moving toward the kingdom of God. You know, when all the tears are gone and mind has been wholly purified, then you have achieved the consciousness of the kingdom of God. So, I can only imagine this because I'm surely not there yet. I don't even think I'm close. I'm probably not even in the right neighborhood. Uh, because, just because I realize I have a, lot, I have a long ways to go, that my, the tears, the error beliefs, are not completely eradicated from my thinking. And I work on it all the time. Now, I can say that it's better than it used to be. right? So there is progress, and that, I think, is a good thing, and that's encouragement for all of us, I hope. You know, but when all the tears are gone and our mind has been wholly purified, then we, are, we have achieved the consciousness of the kingdom of God. So I think we still have to be concerned about um, this heavenly state of mind. You know, that's the mind that is in a state of growth and expansion toward the kingdom of God. You know, it's like we're always practicing. You know, the people in our life, the circumstances in our life, the things that show up for us on a day-to-day -day basis, that's, what's that's where our practice is that's going to take us up to the next level of our spiritual growth and evolution. You know, learning how to live harmoniously with the people who are in our life right now, loving the people who are showing up for us, that's how we move to the next state of consciousness. It's not like, you know, God, if I could just get past this stuff, then I could get to the really good stuff. It's like, no, no, no. This stuff that we have in our life right now is the way to the really, really good stuff. I think we still have to be concerned. We still have to be concerned about maintaining a heavenly state of consciousness. And I know we can all do it. I know we have all experienced it thus far. See, now, if we do that, then we ultimately come to the kingdom of God, you know, and that expansion is caused as we take 
these steps to rid our consciousness of those things that are not of the kingdom of God, right? That we, we're becoming more and more conscious, you know? So Jesus, Jesus grasped the spirit of the law fully, I think, you know, and he applied it to his own personal life and elevated his life, his own life, into a state of resurrection. I think this is, this is not, I don't think of this as deifying Jesus. I think a higher way is, is what he said. He says, you know, call, call not thou me good. There is but one good, and that is my Father who is in heaven. So he's saying, don't put him on a pedestal, right? So, and this is one of the things that I loved about New Thought that really made sense to me. That the founders of New Thought saw in Jesus something different than other teachings had found. The founders of, the early founders of New Thought saw Jesus as the great example of what we might become. That he was not the exception. See, up until the founding of New Thought, people really thought that Jesus had it going on, he was special, he had something you don't have, you're never going to measure up, don't even try. Well, that was really encouraging, wasn't it? You know, I mean, it's like, wow, I, no wonder people didn't feel good, you know, but, but what New Thought said is, no, Jesus is showing us, he is the living demonstration of what we may become, that we might be unconditionally loving like him, we might become unconditionally giving like him, we might be of great service to humanity like him. So I think that's really, really exciting. You know, we don't have to put him on a pedestal, it's just to recognize, wow, he's always showing us, like, it's like he's a few steps further down the path than we are, you know? And so it's, it's um, if somebody has achieved what you want to achieve, you admire them for it, you know? I think, um, so when you see um, Jesus' words, you know, you ask yourself, is this Jesus the man speaking, or is it um, Christ, the Spirit of God, in man speaking? I've, I've come to realize that I used to think that Jesus just talked. And then I realized at some point, no, he's, he's speaking to different people in different ways. So when Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount, you know, he's talking to a mass of people, thousands of people. So he's speaking to people in a very, I believe, introductory way into the path of consciousness. Now, then he'll be with the disciples, say his, his 12 close friends. And he'll give them a different teaching because their understanding is greater. This is why, you know, he says he does the parables with the big group of people, but to them, he uses some other things. And then, on a step higher than that, is that Jesus is very close to some people. So uh, Peter, James, and John are the three disciples who are with him the most. Uh, for very important things. So like at the transfiguration on the mount and when he's in the garden of Gethsemane and the healing of Jarius' daughter, those three are with them. Um, he's very close to Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Those are his very close personal friends. So the teaching that he shares with them is even a step higher than the teaching he's giving to the 12 disciples, which is higher than what he's giving to the multitude of people. So I think that when we read the words of Jesus, we have to know, gee, who's he talking to? Because that changes. You know, sometimes he's talking to people who are quite advanced on the path. Other times he's talking to people who are just getting ready to take their first steps on the path. It all counts. It's all good. It's all relevant. But, you know, um, many times Jesus delivered his teachings out of the Christ, the Spirit of God in humankind. So Christ is a title given to Jesus, but it's also a title that I believe belongs to all of us, right? At least in potential, that God is individualized in each and every one of us. The fullness of God actually is right where we are. It's not like there's more God someplace else. It's all right here where we are, you know? Um, and people think, well, that just doesn't seem right to me. That just seems so big that, you know, that must be... Uh, a lie, you know, what a trap to feel, uh, it, it is, it's, it's a trap to feel devastated by the circumstances of our life, by the events, you know, because the truth, the spiritual truth that science of mind focuses on is that who you are is always more than the events. The events are like a drop in the bucket and who you are is this enormous ocean of, of spirit. So the infinite intelligence of God operating as mind is in 
all of us. We all have what Jesus had. He accessed it. He used it. You know, Jesus was divine, but so are you. Absolutely. So where in our life right now do we need to access and use this incredible divine potential that has always been here, it will always be here, it's just waiting for us to call it forward into expression. Let's pray. So we turn, thank you. We'll turn our attention inward now for a moment to recognize that we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite loving intelligent spirit. It is the great good to which there is no opposite. It's the truth about each and every one of us, that we are made in the image and in the likeness of God. And therefore, all of God's qualities, all of God's attributes exist within us. There is love, there's peace, there's abundance, there's balance and order and harmony and creativity and joy. Every good and perfect thing of God exists within us, if only in potential. And so recognizing that now, we call it forth into expression. We call forth the qualities of God within us to fill our mind and fill our heart and express in all of the actions that we engage in every day. I know this is the truth about who and what we are and that our life absolutely not only gets to be heaven on earth, but we get to live in the kingdom of God. So we include in our prayer today our family members and our friends, our loved ones, everyone that we hold near and dear, and we know that right where they are, God is present that God's spirit surrounds them as a mantle of peace and a mantle of love, lifting them up above whatever conditions they deal with. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere, synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And we let our prayer be a blessing energy that surrounds our entire earth, touching all people, all circumstances, all situations everywhere. No one is left out. We speak our word that the light of God shines on all people, healing, lifting, renewing. And so with a full heart, I give thanks that this is so, that this absolutely is the truth for each and every one of us today. And so with a full heart, I just release this word. And so it is. Together we all say, Amen.